So what you have here is literally a fusion of outlaw, uh, an outlaw group with the state. Now reversing this directionality in early 2007, the governor of Texas authorized a $5 million project to install video cameras on sections of the federally built Texas-Mexico border wall. These are just different segments of the U.S. border wall. So, so the governor had video cameras installed on, on a section of the wall built by the feds, and these cameras streamed to an open internet site so that, quoting the governor, web users worldwide can watch the border and phone the authorities if they spot apparently illegal crossings. So if you wondered what to do with your insomniac nights, now you know. Now, in addition to the vigilante activity supplementing and even merging with state authority along certain walls, there are other telling emergences on the web that embody this blur. Consider usborderkontrol.com. The name, the logo, the design make it appear at first blush as the official website of the U.S. Border Patrol. In fact, it's not. It's maintained by a group who refer to themselves as anonymous supporters of the Border Patrol who are patently frustrated by the agency's insufficient attention to public relations, political mobilization, and education. They're also frustrated by homeland security policies and technologies that limit what they can do in relation to border security. The personification of sovereign authority here, though, is not limited to website, graphics, or design. Rather, usborderpatrol.com features, among other things, an extensive account of the duties and practices of the Border Patrol, and it presents it in a voice, a written voice, resonant of a certain kind of police bravado and authority. The site addresses its readers in a menacing and snide style, the sort peculiar to power that has contempt for its subjects, likes toying with them, roughing them up a little bit, and isn't being monitored for its professionalism or conduct. In short, the style one can well imagine as the police style at the gateway between the first and the third world. Interestingly, however, while this website text, which is addressed entirely to, a, to a, an alien you seeking to gain illegal entry into the U.S. and letting that you know just what can happen to it if it's found out. Interestingly, the text is written entirely in English. So it would not actually appear to be warning or educating this you that it interpolates, but rather it would appear to be performing the power of the Border Patrol for U.S. citizens who might be dubious about the validity or effectiveness of that power, or perhaps even more importantly, performing the power of the Border Patrol in a fashion precisely that the Border Patrol itself cannot do publicly or officially. Re-enter the Minutemen who track down and, um, and, and capture illegal entrants when the Border Patrol does not. So here's another perfect instance of a new form of political decisionism and extra-legality emerging in the wake of nation-state sovereignty, a practice of vigilantism that inadvertently undoes its aim to supplement the state's faltering power to defend the nation. And the same kind of activity, as many of you know, is repeated at the site of Israeli settlements along the uh, wall and um, in relationship to Palestinian villages in the West Bank. I want to turn now to the issue of staging and theatricality. If the new walls sometimes effectively interdict the foreign bodies that they attempt to um, stop, they're often but elaborate political gestures and symbols. They're often but sops to certain constituencies. They're signs of what distresses but can't be contained. They're often as irrelevant to the project of national security as the scrupulous wanding and suitcase disemboweling of an elderly couple in a rural airport. Consider, at the Tijuana-San Diego border, that's the westernmost point of the U.S.-Mexico border, the U.S.-Mexico wall consists of three layers of 15-foot-high steel walls. That was the very first picture I showed you. It looks really um, like nothing less than an armed military camp. It is adorned with sensors and video surveillance technology. It's monitored by hundreds of border patrol in jeeps and helicopters. But a mere 30 miles east, there are huge gaps in a single-layer fence. The border operation at El Paso, Texas is similar. 
Now, for would-be migrants, as I already suggested, whether temporary or permanent, the effect of the fortifications is to require a longer, more expensive, and more dangerous journey through mountains and deserts than before the walls are built, were built. This effect, in turn, has produced a much more sophisticated and expensive smuggling industry, and much greater likelihood as well that illegal entrants will stay in the U.S. permanently rather than risk semi-annual crossings. It has not actually altered the number of illegal em immigrants coming into the United States. So if such entrance is not deterred by the wall, why build it? As one border expert, Peter Andreas, has argued, these walls have less to do with actual deterrence and much more to do with managing the image of the border. He adds, border policing is a ritualistic performance. When the failures of the deterrence effort lead to a performance crisis, the performance, performers save face by promising a bigger and better show. Consider again Operation Gatekeeper, the name of the westernmost uh, border fortification in the U.S.-Mexico wall. It was undertaken by the Clinton administration at the instigation of a California Democratic senator in order to wrest the border issue away from California Republicans and win over Republicans to Democratic uh, uh, Congress people. The militarization of the border was designed to send the message that Democrats were not soft on illegal immigration, and California senators made frequent use of the steel wall as a backdrop for press conferences. The tripling of the wall under the G.W. Bush administration was an up-the-ante move by a conservative California congressman to show that he was even tougher on the border than the Democrats. And the same constant jockeying over who supports a bigger, badder wall dogged the recent U.S. elections. Every politician is publicly for the wall. Very few believe in its efficacy. In fact, McCain's admission during the last electoral season that the wall maybe wasn't the way to go was understood by many as the beginning of the end of his campaign. Walls not only provide spectacular backdrops for politicians and parties facing quagmired immigration and amnesty policies, they resurrect an image of the state as sustaining the very powers of protection and self-determination challenged by terrorist technologies on one side and neoliberal capitalism on the other. Such walls are figures of such protection and self-determination, and more generally figures of the resolve and capacity for action identified with the political autonomy generated by sovereignty. If this figuration is an illusion, that doesn't cancel its importance. Indeed, these walls may be politically salient to the very degree that they're relatively ineffective. Indian economist Jagdash Bhagwati put this baldly. He wrote, while the decision to construct a fence along the enormous India-Bangladesh border was an ineffective policy, it was nevertheless a splendid policy. For to be seen to be doing nothing at all, even though one could not really close the border, would have been politically explosive. And building the fence was the least disruptive way of doing nothing while appearing to be doing something. Now, importantly, however, such performances do not simply respond to or exploit existing xenophobia or racism. They actively produce them as they performatively displace internal problems outward, as they displace national needs or national demands, for example, for drugs or cheap labor, into a spectacle of the invading alien, as they transform the violence of globalization or colonization into the specter of alien violence or alien sabotage. To see more clearly how this performance operates, I want to turn finally to the economy security nexus in which walls um, operate and to which they contribute. Conventional wisdom about neoliberal globalization is that it produces opposing economy and security imperatives. The, the idea in the conventional wisdom is that economic imperatives drive toward the elimination of barriers, while security imperatives drive toward fortification of barriers. But the most